This subject is a complex one. It illustrates powerfully how truly systematic theology, like indeed all truth, really is. I make no apologies for the fact that this opening speech will be fairly packed. I'm going to skip quite quickly through it because it involves so many things. Thankfully, it's being recorded, so I do encourage you to look back if you miss anything or if you want to look into it more. Um, to help structure our thoughts for this evening, however, let's note the nature of the proposition before us. My opponent has proposed this evening that indulgences are a fundamental denial of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To see why he is completely wrong, I think we have to answer two questions. What are indulgences? And much, much more basically, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? I propose, therefore, to answer both, and in comparing one to the other, to show why indulgences are fundamentally an affirmation and an application of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the gospel? Let's start with that. Euangelion, evangelion, those are the words underneath it, reducible to good and news. You know, and angelion from Anglos, meaning messenger, uh, from the old English God spell, meaning good news. Very arguably, this is deeply unhelpful, however, as a translation of euangelion. That we've had lovely weather over the last few days, partly for today, was good news. If someone buys me a pint after this debate, that would be good news, certainly. To describe, however, the cosmic, awesome, life changing, earth shattering, wonderful news of Jesus Christ, to describe that as good news is damning by faint praise. It's a pathetic translation. Rather, gospel is an announcement of victory. In the closer context of the first centuries BC and AD, so the, the documents that we have, Siculus and Cicero in the first century BC, you've got Josephus and Plutarch in the first century AD, it's used in the documents that we have to denote a specific form of good tidings, the announcement of a great victory. So here's the situation. Your city is about to be invaded by an army uh, from a surrounding nation, and your army has gone out to meet them in the battlefield. And you're terrified, because if the enemy meets the city, they'll torch everything, the men will be killed, the women raped, the children enslaved. It will be disaster. It will be a threat to your very existence. And then a corux, a herald, comes along and declares, the battle's won. There is no more threats. Invading army's been destroyed. We're safe. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a euangelion. The Priene calendar inscription, in fact, even uses euangelion to refer to what Caesar Augustus, to whom it attributes divinity, brought to the world as a soter, as a saviour, who would end all wars and arrange all things. So that's the context, then, in which the Christians took this word from the surrounding culture and they used it and invested it with new meaning. The gospel, then, the Christian euangelion, is the proclamation of a fact. The fact is, the victory that Christ has accomplished and the establishment of his messianic kingdom. Related to this, we see an ancient distinction between the core of the gospel, the kerugma, and then the developed teaching coming out side of it. So the use of the term gospel then evolved in the way it is employed in the early modern period to not just be the base announcement of the fact of Christ's redemption, but also the whole new covenant law and the whole new covenant itself established by him and in his church. That's how it's often used today. But originally, scripturally, it's the announcement of that event of the coming of the kingdom through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. How does this relate to our subject tonight? Well, due to the implications on the content of the gospel relating to what Christ did, specifically what he accomplished on the cross. Before we understand what he did on the cross, before we understand the atonement, we have to understand some background details. The fundamental piece of which, which is incredibly important for Christian theology today, is the nature of God himself. God is the ipsum esse subsistent, subsistent being itself, or the ground of all being, as that's sometimes translated. God is not a being, like a bloke. He's not a superman, like Thor. God is the source of all being, the source of all goodness, all perfection. All perfection and goodness come from him because he is goodness, he is perfection. They flow from his nature as God. He is holy. Since he is the perfect source of goodness, all evil, all sin is an offense against him, the transcendent creator, the author of history, the perfect source of all good. And it creates an inequality of justice, a debt that has to be satisfied before the sinner can enter into communion with him. And if that doesn't happen, then justice has to be applied. The just expression of God's just wrath. This comes in two ways. The, the reatus culpe, guilt, and associated with that reatus pine, punishment. In order for man to avoid the just punishment of sin, God has to be propitiated. It requires propitiation, an act that will cancel his just wrath against us. The means by which this is achieved is satisfaction through expiation. Let me explain that. Expiation is an act of compensation which satisfies the debt of sin. This satisfaction propitiates God, which means God's wrath is avoided against sin, 
and our relation to God is turned from one of wrath to one of friendship. Acts of propitiation are formed in the Old Testament, usually by righteous men, not perfect men by any means, but righteous men. Uh, we have Abraham for the Sodomites, although in that case he failed. Uh, Moses for Israel after the Gold Calf episode. We have Phineas for Israel after the sin of Zimri and Cosby. Even before the Mosaic Law, however, the Israelites would offer sacrifice to God as a form of propitiation. Sacrifice was understood as the way you would normally do this. So we see the sacrifices of Abel, we see the sacrifice of Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, I mean, poor old Job. Job uh, from sacrifices for his children on the off chance that they were sinning. Uh, such a good man that he was. And after Eliphaz, uh, you might remember wrongly, attributes sin to Job, in fact, as the root of his sufferings, the Lord requires for a sacrifice to be provided of seven bulls and seven rams as a burnt offering by Eliphaz, and Job to pray for Bildad and Eliphaz and Zophar altogether, because they accused him of this. And David to save off further destruction against Israel but through his avenging angel. The angel tells King David to set up an altar and again to set up burnt offerings, which he does, avoiding the wrath of God. Now, in the Old Testament law, sacrifice becomes a ritualized system. Leviticus 1.16 shows that of sin offerings, guilt offerings, all sorts of offerings under the Levitical priesthood. Specifically, any sacrifice meant to atone for sin required the shedding of animal blood. And indeed, without, as Hebrews tells us, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. Why is that? I mean, what possible sense does that make? Well, it's because the blood contains the life, as it says in Leviticus 17.11. The life of the animal, in this case, was the currency that paid back the debt of sin. However, these sacrifices could never properly pay for sin, because the blood of an animal, the life of an animal, really has no value. And all the priests who performed these sacrifices were imperfectly righteous and of themselves. As the God-man, however, Jesus Christ is perfect high priest and perfect victim. He's fully God, and therefore only he can satisfy sin because he's fully divine, he's able to perfectly fulfill the law, so he's perfectly righteous, and he's completely without sin. He's our perfect human representative, and St. John presents him as clothed with a long robe and golden girdle, the same vestments that were used by the Levitical priest, so he's our high priest. But Jesus Christ is also, this is the key thing, the victim. He is the Lamb of God. He's the Amnos to Theo, the Annus Dei, the Lamb of God. And this is a motif that runs throughout the Johannine literature, the literature written by St. John. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, says John the Baptist. I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. The Greek is histomai, having been standing, and sephatso, having been slain. So St. John is using participles to describe both Christ's standing and slain conditions, indicating they happened in the past and were ongoing. He's standing before the throne of God, presenting his slain condition to the Father. Christ, it says, obtained the church with his blood, because the associated truth here is that he's the Lamb of God, and just as the animals, including the Paschal Lamb, would have been slain, and the blood would have been paying back the debt of sin, so this is true of the God-man. Christ obtained the church with his blood, since we are now justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. We have redemption through his blood, brought in the blood of Christ, we make peace in the blood of his cross, etc., etc. The entire New Testament is soaked, as it were, with references to the precious blood of Christ as our atoning sacrifice. It also says, may the God of peace by the blood of the eternal covenant. So this is not just of one sacrifice, it's the blood of the eternal covenant. Equip you with everything good that you may do his will. Earlier in the writer of the Hebrews has, has said that those who refuse to meet together have spurned the Son of God and profaned the blood of the covenant. St. Peter summarizes all this perfectly. We are ransomed with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And it's not just the quality of his sacrifice as the God-man, it's also his charity. An act of perfect self-sacrificial love was his sacrifice on the cross. For this reason, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. We are saved by the precious blood, the shedding, the immolation of his precious blood, and the offering, the oblation of the same on the altar of the cross, pays back the debt of sin infinitely and thus permanently. He's the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but those of the whole world. The sacrifice of Christ's precious blood is the meritorious cause of our salvation. Now that's a key concept which I will now move on to. There are various many ways we can talk about the causation of a thing. So the analogy that I'll use here is a house, but we're going to go on to look at salvation itself. 
If you talk about a house, you have a material cause, which is the stuff it's made out of. You've got a formal cause, which is the blueprint. You've got the efficient cause, the person who affects it, the builders. You've got the instrumental causes that they use. In other words, that would be their tools. You've got the meritorious cause. The meritorious cause is the person who paid for the building in the first place. These are all useful ways in which we can think about the way that something is caused. The final cause is slightly different. It's the purpose for which it's built. Well, let's apply that to justification. The Council of Trent, which is the great council that dealt with justification salvation more broadly, uses this schema. The efficient cause, the principal efficient cause of our justification, of our salvation, is the merciful blessed Trinity. The secondary efficient cause is his grace, merited, merited by Christ on the cross. Because it's the propitiatory sacrifice of the cross which made satisfaction for us unto the Father and merited our justification. Christ is the sole meritorious cause. Let me say that again. He's the sole meritorious cause. There are instrumental causes, however, that communicate the grace that was bought for us by his sacrifice. What are those? Baptism, very centrally, obviously. Confession, our ongoing works as well. These are all instrumental causes. What do I mean by that? They are means by which we access what Christ has merited for us. It's a bit like this. Let's say I want a shower and I'm a, I'm a child. It makes it easier. Let's say I'm a child and I want to have a shower. Now, who pays the bill for that? It's my dad. So, okay, so the father has paid the bill for the shower to take place. The efficient cause of my being cleansed will be the water falling on me, or at least in a secondary sense. But I have to turn the faucet. Now, the turning of the faucet doesn't earn me anything. The turning of the faucet doesn't uh, merit in a strict sense my shower. But I have to do it, otherwise I won't gain the benefits of it. Do you see the difference? Meritorious causes who pays for it, who merits it. Instrumental causes how you gain the benefits of it. So what are indulgences? How is this all this relevant to indulgences? We've done 12 minutes already. Well, well, we have answered what the gospel is. And we've answered what the meritorious cause is. The announcement of Christ's victory, especially through the perfect propitiatory sacrifice of his cross, the offering of his precious blood. So how does this affect indulgences? Well, let's just define what they are. An indulgence is a remission before God of the temporal punishment, temporal punishment due to sins, whose guilt has already been forgiven, which the faithful Christian who is duly disposed gains under certain prescribed conditions through the action of the church when, as the minister of redemption, she dispenses and applies with authority the treasury of the merits of Christ and the saints. And note those three things that I've emphasized. The temporal punishment, the minister of redemption, the treasury of merits. We're going to go into those because those are the elements of this that need to be clarified. Temporal versus eternal punishment. The eternal punishment due to our sins is avoided by our access to the instrumental causes of justification. So the grace merited by the cross which we gain through baptism, through faith. In other words, all the sacraments of faith. Nonetheless, we still suffer temporal punishments for sin. And we see this. There are penalties that we go through through our life as part of God's organization of cosmic justice throughout the world. Regardless of our eternal punishment, which we have thankfully avoided by the cross in a direct sense, there are still temporal punishments we have to go through. One of which are the simple penal consequences, the penalties of original sin. Women suffering in childbirth, man working by the sweat of his brow, suffering and death itself. Now, those of you who believe yourselves to be forgiven by original sin, I imagine it's most of you here, it's certainly anyone who's been baptized. Which of the men who think so don't expect to work by the sweat of their brow? Which of the women who think so don't expect to, if you haven't already, suffer through childbirth? Opioids and blocks and nitrous oxide notwithstanding. Who here expects never to experience suffering or physical death? Yeah, I thought so. No one here is a fantasist. That's good. So who here has never suffered any temporal consequences for their sin as well? We have penal consequences and penalties of personal sin. If I lie and I suffer humiliation when I'm found out, that is a penal consequence of my sin. It's a temporal consequence of my sin. And we see this, don't we, in Holy Scripture itself. Look at, for example, the incidents of King David. After King David has killed Uriah the Hittite and he's stolen his wife effectively, he slept with Bathsheba and made her pregnant, committed adultery in other words. He's sorry for his sin, he repents of his sin, very, very powerfully. In fact, he's, in, he's weeping, he's fasting, he's laying prostrate upon the ground for seven days. He's forgiven by God, and yet, despite his forgiveness, he suffers a temporal punishment. His temporal punishment is what? The death of the child that he conceived Bathsheba and the rape of his wives. 
which in a sense is a payback for what he did. He killed, so a life for a life. He violated sexual integrity, so his sexual integrity via his wives is also thereby dealt with as well. This was a redress. That's the temporal punishment. And we see this collectively as well. The fact that the Israelites did not trust God, that he would be their savior effect if you bring them to the promised land through the golden calf episode. What does that mean for the Israelites who did that? They had to go around in the desert and never see the promised land ultimately. Their lack of patience originally meant that their patience later would never be rewarded. How do we deal with this? How does this temporal punishment get dealt with? Well, we, get, we deal with it through our experience. We deal with it through our everyday sanctification, but we also deal with it through what is called purgatory. Purgatory is a state after death where those who are justified go through any remaining temporal punishment for their sins as part of our final purification. This process is called satispatio, as we've seen, from satis, meaning enough, satiated, in other words, and passio, suffering. We know nothing unclean shall enter heaven. We know that without holiness, no one will see God. Yet we all die in a state where we're not completely sanctified. No one dies morally perfect. We all have sanctification to go through by the time we go. So purgatory satisfies the lesser cosmic justice of temporal punishment, but frees us as well from the last remaining impurities and imperfections, finishing our sanctification. We see this in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15 which describes an eschatological fire in which a person, through their works, is tried and rewarded in the good and suffering in the bad. When it talks about uh, suffering loss, suffering loss, that word is zemiothesitai, which is the future indicative passive third person singular, and it's of zemiou, which means receive damage uh, or receive an injury, as in punishment. The construction is used, actually, in Exodus 21, Proverbs 19:19, uh, to describe something which is a form of punishment. So it also describes a financial penalty and punishment, also other forms of punishment elsewhere in the Septuagint. In the New Testament, it's used to actually denote eternal punishment. So this is a phrase used not just to describe, oh, I've, I've lost out on something. No, it means a penalty that you suffer because of the works that are burnt up. If you want to see the context of this idea of the fire that burns up the wood, the hay, the straw, and purifies the good, the silver, and the precious stones. Look at all the other references that are there within the Holy Scriptures to this idea of a purifying fire. The crucible is for silver, and the furnace is for gold, and the Lord tries hearts. That's Proverbs 17.3. Purify themselves and be refined, Daniel 12. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refines silver and test them as gold is tested, Zechariah 13. For he is like a refiner's fire and like full of soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver till they present right offerings to the Lord. And so on and so forth. All of these references to gold and silver Sound familiar? That's exactly the wording used in 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15. And actually, someone who saw this was my favorite Ulsterman, in fact, and favorite Anglican, as we're here, C.S. Lewis. In the letters to Malcolm, he talks about the right view returning magnificently about purgatory in Newman's dream, where the saved soul at the very foot of the throne begs to be taken away and cleansed. It cannot bear for a moment longer with its darkness to affront that light. And he says, our souls demand purgatory, don't they? Would it not break the heart if God said to us, it is true, my son, that your breath smells and your rags drip with mud and slime, but we are charitable here and no one will upbraid you with these things nor draw away from you. Enter into the joy. Should we not reply with submission, sir? And if there is no objection, I'd rather be cleansed first. It may hurt, you know, even so, sir. It's something that even if you're not Catholic, you intuit you realize the way that sanctification works, that sanctification involves suffering. We have this false dichotomy between temporal punishment and fatherly chastening. There is no distinction between them. They are the same thing. The same God who is holiness and justice is the same God who is love and mercy. The both happen at the same time. We see prayers for the dead as an illustration of this. 2 Maccabees 2, 12, 41 to 45. We don't have time to go into it too much, but the idea there is that Judas Maccabees Maccabeus is effectively trying to pray for and offer sacrifice on behalf of uh, Jews who have died. Now, all this really proves is prayers for the dead. It doesn't prove purgatory. I'm not saying it does. All I'm saying is that the idea of praying for the dead, the idea of making sacrifices for the dead, was something that was very much believed at the time. And to this day, Orthodox Jews pray for the dead. The Muniz Chadish is something you pray as, for, as an Orthodox Jew a year after the death of your loved one. As all ancient Christian churches indeed do, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, the Assyrian Church of the East, and the Catholic Church all pray for the dead. You don't need to pray for those in heaven. There's no point praying for those in hell. 
So what does that indicate? It indicates a tertium quid, a third thing, a state whereby our prayers can help those in that state. We don't just help the dead by prayers, but by spiritual solidarity. We see this in the third century practice of libelli. Libelli were certificates of indulgence which were issued to people in the third century, this is generally around North Africa and Asia Minor, in which confessors or martyrs interceded for the lapsi, those who had effectively apostatized under Roman persecution, but had come back to repentance. And confessors were understood to be petitioning that their own merits should be applied to the lapsi to procure them a remission of the temporal punishment due to their defection. This wasn't simply a, a remission of canonical penance. Rather, it was believed that it availed before God and remitted the temporal punishment that would otherwise be required after death. You want to see a discussion of this, go to St. Cyprian's de lapsis. Now, we just used the word merit, and we heard it discussed somewhat in Dr. White's presentation. Beware of linguistic anachronism and ambiguity. When we use the term merit, what we don't mean is earning something. What we don't mean, I've already made it very clear, the sole meritorious cause of our salvation is what? Christ and his precious blood. It's not us. Strictly speaking, only Christ strictly merits anything. All we do is receive rewards, due rewards. Now, we see this uh, in Romans 2, for he will render to eat every man according to his works. We see this in 1 Corinthians 3. He who plants and he who waters are equal, and each one shall receive his wages according to his labor. This isn't trying to say that you earn salvation or you earn grace. You can't possibly earn grace by definition. What it's saying is that our good works are rewarded by a loving Father with further grace in our sanctification. The analogy I'll use is the analogy of a father and a child. If a father says to a child, okay, if you do your choice, if you mow the lawn, let's say, I'll take you out to the cinema, I'll take you to the pictures, or I'll buy you an ice cream, or I'll buy you a present, or something like that. Now, that isn't a commercial kid quid pro quo. You don't say, right, okay, I've, I've earned that now, Dad. No. Dad could just say, do your chores, without any reward whatsoever. But because of his loving condescension and kindness to his child, he gives him a reward. That's what we're talking about. The whole way that Christianity works, the whole way the church works, the whole way our salvation works is not as a law court or as a quid pro quo relationship. It's as a loving father to his children. This is why St. Augustine can say, because our works, all the good works that we do, are enabled by God's actual graces themselves, the supernatural life that he pours into us to enable us to do this. He says, if then your good merits are God's gifts, God does not crown your merits as your merits, but as his own gifts. So this is not a matter of earning salvation or trusting on something other than Christ or trusting something other than God. It's about appealing through Christ. That's why St. Philip Neri says, never say what great things the saints do, but what great things God does in his saints. Again, what are we? We are instrumental causes. We're not meritorious causes. The only meritorious cause is Christ alone. But there is also the concept we heard, the Saurus Meritorum. The Saurus Meritorum is the idea that all of the merits that Christ has, all the merits of his precious blood, and all the merits that he causes through us are all in this treasury of merit. That's absolutely true. Note the difference, however, between the efficient cause of it, God, the true strict meritorious cause, God the Son, and again the instrumental causes that contribute to it, which is simply us. It's simply God pouring his grace through us and meriting his own merits thereby. It's not a mixture of Christ's merits and that of the saints like Mary, because the merits of the saints are not alien to those of Christ. They are the merits of Christ poured into us. You can't merit anything on your own. Only in the grace of God can you. The merits of the saints are the merits of Christ applied in the lives of his saints. And the reason why we can believe in the idea of indulgences, the application of those merits, as we will see, is because of the power of the keys. The power of the keys is this. In Matthew 16, 18 to 19, St. Peter is promised by Christ the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answers him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood does not reveal this to you, but my father is in heaven, and I tell you, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Now this is, a, is an allusion back. Anyone who heard these words of our Lord would have known what he was saying. It goes back to Isaiah 15 to 23, where the Lord replaces Shebna as the al habith that is to say the, the, the chap who's over the house, the chief steward of the Davidic kingdom with Eliakim, who is given the key of the, king, of the house of David in Isaiah 22, verses 20 to 22. This is hugely important when we understand why our Lord is making reference to this. Christ as the Messiah, as the Mashiach, is also the Davidic king. He has come to fulfill the prophecies that would say the establishment of the Davidic kingdom would happen again. 
By promising to give St. Peter the keys of the kingdom, our Lord is investing him with a station analogous to that of Eliakim and others, especially because of the messianic significance of the king who was king at the time, King, king Hezekiah. Remember the King Hezekiah, where when he's on his deathbed, he asks God for mercy, and God says, I've heard thy prayer, I've seen thy tears, and behold, I've healed thee. On the third day, thou shalt go to the temple of the Lord. Anyone hearing Christ allude to this is going to realize he's making a messianic reference. And he's going to associate Jesus and Peter with Hezekiah and Eliakim. The keys indicate a spiritual authority. Not just as the kingdom of heaven includes the, the earthly church, as we see from the use of that phrase, kingdom of heaven, by our Lord in parables in Matthew 13, for example. But because the keys referred to in the book of the apocalypse refer to keys of death and of hell and the bottomless pit. That's why the gates of hell cannot prevail against the church, because the church has the keys to these places. James might want to say that these verses disprove Petrine authorities. Christ hold these keys in the book of the apocalypse. And the key of the house of David in Apocalypse 3.7 is said to be held by him particularly. But this tells us absolutely nothing. Christ is delegating his authority to St. Peter as the Davidic kings did to their chief stewards. They didn't relinquish the keys. They delegated to them. Besides which, the book of the Apocalypse is eschatological and thereby based on future events when earth is passing away. This is all about the nuptial covenant. Because the church is in that natural covenant. We heard earlier about the Lamb. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Because the, the idea of the covenant is as a nuptial image. Holy Scripture, especially St. Paul, shows that the diatheke, the covenant, is not a purely passive inheritance. It's a transactional relationship. It's not unilateral. It's bilateral. It is a relationship, in other words. And we see this used in that simile in Ephesians 5. In the nuptial framework of St. Paul's day, the covenant between husband and wife was confirmed. The bride's authority extended to that of a full partnership with her husband in the mutual and all-important enterprise of bearing and raising their children and governing the marital household. If the church is the bride of Christ, she is therefore the steward of his merits. The church is the fully endowed spouse of Christ, who has, by virtue of her ongoing covenant with him, has the authority to distribute the contents of the marital treasury for the sake of her children, i.e., faithful Christians. Indulgences, therefore, are an imputation of Christ's merits. This is what's so you know, ironic about this. This is the one part of Catholic soteriology which actually applies in a Protestant sense, that actually does use the idea of imputation. Are an imputation of Christ's merits to the believer on the basis of concessiones. They are attached to your works. The, the, what the works have their own value, which somehow earns God's grace, but rather that God, through his grace, through the action of his church, is granting you these, uh, this imputation happening. This is to encourage the Christian faithful in holiness. It includes reading the scriptures for at least half an hour a day, participating in some of the services during the week, Christian unity, and other such things. So as Mormon argues in her book, Indulgences, Luther, Catholicism, and the Imputation of Merit, in her indulgence we find the Catholic Church at her most Lutheran as she imputes the merits of Christ to cover our accounts before God and to compensate for her losses. So, this is not grace doled out. It is the ontic power of supernatural life of God. It is the faithful application of the merits of Christ by Christ's bride to remit temporal punishment and the enabled communication of spiritual solidarity between Christians so as to foster the holiness and purification of the members of his body. This is not contrary to the gospel. This is an application of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I commend it to you tonight. Thank you. Thank you.